I'm Debbie Spath. I am a 2018 inductee into the U.S. Balloonie Hall of Fame. And we're going to reminisce for a little while here with Tucker Comstock, who was inducted into the U.S. Ballooning Hall of Fame for the class of 2022. So congratulations, Tucker. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So this is just a relaxing thing. We just want to, there are balloonists who um, were at the Hall of Fame induction, and they didn't know any of those history of how you guys were involved in getting competition going and, the, and sanction tasks and the safety seminar. So let, let's start with competition, because I first met you in 1975, when you were the scoring officer for the Kettle Moraine Balloon Rally in West Bend, Wisconsin, on in a cold, cold February in 1975. Oh, wow. <laughs> Remember those cold flights? Yeah. So I know that you were the scoring manager. So um, can you, for the Hot Air Events Committee at that time. So can mm -hmm. you tell us, and I know that was the first event that sanctioned tasks were being held because ballooning had got grown so much. Can you kind of share some of that? Um, well, competition pretty quickly became our lives once uh, uh, Bruce didn't win <laughs> the first national championship. His, his instructor did, Danny Floden. Um, and so but we were completely trapped by the enthusiasm and the, the challenge of getting a balloon someplace. I mean, we had never tried. Nobody had ever really tried before competition to take a balloon to a specific location. Nobody told us where to fly. We just got it up. And if we could find a good place to land, that was all we needed to know. Uh, but competition did something to us the same way that competition in any sport does. It makes you better, uh, makes you a better pilot. And so it became challenging, not just for the pilot, but I was the chase crew uh, and I was the person that helped from the ground. And there's a lot of things in competition that have, I hope, translated into all flying um, uh, about specifically things that made flying safer. Uh, and I'll, I, I want to go into that very much in a little bit more detail a little bit later because you're asking me about the early competition. Right. Um, so the big thing in early competition was to get regulations that made the competition legitimate. Every sport has to have rules or nobody knows how to compete <laughs> uh, uh, and whether you're good of as or better than somebody else, which is the ultimate goal of a competition is to come up with somebody who wins it. Um, and in the case of um, my contribution or I guess both uh, uh, Bruce and I were super involved in trying to figure out ways to score, ways to uh, uh, you know, measure. It was difficult to measure. You couldn't measure the balloons. The very first nationals, yeah, you did. You measured where the balloon landed in relation to the target. Everybody, everything was a, a, a competition landing. Um, okay, so can you, can you explain that? Happen. Yeah, can you explain to the pilots, how, or to, the, to our audience who's going to watch this, that there were no markers at that point? Correct. Uh, <laughs> the only way to... Uh, decide who won is you put a mark out in a field somewhere and uh, and you're supposed to fly to that mark and then uh, wherever you landed there somebody would come by with a tape measure and start measuring you to that point and of course that got pretty bad and it also got very congested it got a little bit hairy no a, a lot hairy with everybody trying to come in on a target at the same time. And uh, a lot of people had landed and other people are flying towards them. So it was after that first competition, we recognized we got to do something to get rid of making the event about crashing into other balloons. Okay. Um, and that is the origin of the, the, the marker. Uh, something that you could use as your indicator of where eventually you would be landing or could have landed. Um, so the, the rules for the marker had to be very specific because it had to measure something besides the pilot's ability to throw it long distances or to um, uh, you know, modify the, the, the device in some way that could make it you know, um, uh, take longer to get to the ground or take less time to get to the ground, et cetera. So, so standardizing. Yeah, we standardized. We standardized rules. Uh, we standardized uh, procedures that 
the scoring people had to use. Um, and that's what a lot of that was what I worked on with uh, with Tom more than anyone, Tom Shepard. Um, and then Carl uh, got involved trying to figure out uh, rules that were sort of overall rules for competition. That's but Carl Stefan. Carl Stefan, yeah. So that's what was going on prior to the invention of the drop marker. Well, not a big invention. Certainly any, any uh, 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 two-handed monkey could have built one, the first one. Um, but it was, in fact, a big uh, uh, move forward for competition and legitimizing competition. It legitimized it not just for the pilots, but it also started to make sense for the press and for spectators. And then all of a sudden you started having people coming watching, excited to watch these markers come out of the balloon. I mean, you would, I mean that became the show, throwing the markers out. Right. So uh, uh, competition legitimized with uh, uh, the invention of the rules. And that certainly propelled ballooning into the press a lot. Uh, okay. As if, yeah, it's nice to have us in the press for something besides an accident, which was before that time. That's about all we got in there for. Okay. Uh, or we would take a member of the press in a balloon basket and they would describe their experiences as a passenger. Sure. But yeah. Okay, Tucker, I'm so, going to pause for a minute because you, yeah. you've moved away from your camera, so I can only see your shoulder uh, now. All right. <laughs> there you go. Now I can right. see you perfectly again. Yeah. Great. Okay, I didn't want to great. interrupt your story. So go. Okay. So, yeah. so now we've got. Um, so the markers, so that I know that in 1981, when the worlds came to Battle Creek, markers were a big deal because they had to be dropped from the top of the tallest hotel building downtown for the FAA to approve them. So it took a few a little while for everything to fall into place, but markers are um, something that people don't realize they haven't always been there. Oh, so. no. Um, there were all sorts of things we tried beforehand. We tried marshmallows with strings. We tried oh. uh, uh, all sorts of different devices to drop that wouldn't get eaten. Um, and even the early balloon baggies uh, were filled with rice and things that, that uh, we wanted it to be biodegradable, but we didn't want it to biodegrade before it got scored. Uh, <laughs> so those were conflicting <laughs> uh, goals. Uh, anyway, the drop marker was probably a good uh, contribution to ballooning. And the great thing is we were able to build them out of scrap fabric from the factory. Um, right. And yeah. I think by the time, you know, that this really got going, I think every balloon manufacturer contributed either uh, fabric or fabric and labor because they right. are very labor intensive to build the first, first time you build them. I know, um, until you get a routine going, right? Yeah, exactly. The yeah. other part of it, the scoring is keeping track of records, keeping track of what distance is on an individual task. But then how does that task in Wisconsin compare to a task in Missouri? Um, and so there was a whole bunch of other types of um, uh, analysis that went on. That was more Carl Steffen's area. How are we going to keep track and, and legitimately select the right people who will make it into the national competition? That was the whole goal, is to get into a national competition. Right. Um, that was Indianola, obviously, but you had to you had to qualify for it, and the qualifying had to be fair for the, the people in Albuquerque and the people in Wisconsin. Uh, so, how do you compare those results? And, and that was also done very much in those early '80s. Anything else? Well, uh, do you remember, I, I know pilots don't know this, the younger pilots, and that's probably anybody after the 1990s, but that the nationals, there was actually a setup where because there were so many pilots wanting to qualify, it was limited to 100 and then cut to 32, I believe. I have, it, it, you don't, you're asking that person who can't even <laughs> read the numbers well, one through 10. Oh, <laughs> uh, well, well, that that was part of all part of the plan that you guys did. So that, that was all interesting stuff. So we can move on to another topic. Um, okay. Also said that um, you were um, chair of the BFA Education Committee in um, 1978 yeah. to 1980. And that you, so can you tell us about your work that you did for that? A lot of it was related to the, my intent, my unintentional uh, contact with power lines, making it clear that I had learned, well, I had because Bruce did not accept the excuse that, oh, I couldn't, I couldn't avoid it. 
uh, I wrote an article which became a, a seminal article on how to avoid power lines. And um, uh, that was not only published in the pilot newsletter, uh, it was published, uh, it was picked up by a lot of balloon clubs around the country and expanded on. And I'm sure that the current version of power line avoidance um, is is vastly different from what it started out as. The important thing is that it's still being written, it's still being improved. Mm-hmm. Uh, and every time there is an accident uh, with a power line, especially, it should get reviewed by everybody that flies. Um, and it should get contributed to by the people who have the same sort of incident that I had. I mean, the stupid things I did after I touched the power line, I did rip out and the power uh, balloon deflated over the power line. That I don't care about. That was the right thing to do. What wasn't the right thing to do was to pull that thing out of the power line by myself. Uh, That is the horrible lesson that that most people don't get out of the idea of power line contact. Um, There are parts of the balloon that can absolutely withstand power line contact, but the the part that you (laughs) you gotta make damn darn sure that you stay away from is anything that will come near the fuel system uh, and the burner and the support cables. Um, And the other part of it is uh, you've got to be able to deflate the balloon when you get the chance to do it. So that deflation system has to be so integrated, it can never get away from you. And I have seen, unfortunately, when I was, you know, back in those days, pilots take it off with their deflation line wrapped around the crown line. Um, I've seen them take off with the deflation line not hooked to the balloon in any way. So there's there's a lot of things that the early balloonists uh, did wrong uh, and that they survived is good, uh, but we should have all learned from all of those mistakes. And that's what the education committee was really set up to do, sort of to um, codify uh, the, the, I don't want to say stupid things because- they're not Lessons always learned? Stupid. More the like lessons the lessons learned? Yeah. yeah. And, and, and uh, the pilot newsletter was really dedicated for that purpose. And that's basically the reason it started the pilot newsletter is we wanted to have a place where we could talk about specific accidents Ballooning community knew about these accidents because the grapevine travels faster than the printed word. And, uh, but they didn't know the background or the details of A, how something happened, uh, sure. what decisions were made prior to the accident. And the only way you get that information is you have to be able to interview people to have them. Um, and you can interview the pilot. You can also interview the passengers who can say, well, then I saw my pilot do such and such. Uh, sure. and, everybody and, everybody and, has their own point of view on it, right? Yeah, exactly. So yeah. the whole point of the education committee was to take any information we could glean from accident reports um, and put it into a form that uh, could be taught at a seminar. And I really was involved in setting up the first seminars. And well, I was involved because I, um, you know, uh, I was promoting it. So I got invited a lot to talk at them. Um, And what I usually talked about was accidents that I was involved in either interviewing or accompanying the National Transportation Safety Board when they were looking at the remains of a balloon. Mm-hmm. to try to figure out from the remains what actually happened, whether right. it was an electrical shock or was it a propane uh, fire? What was it that caused this you know, damage? So early ballooning, uh, a lot of uh, what we know um, about um, accidents and avoiding accidents comes from documenting those accidents. Right. And, you know, a lot of pilots do not want to talk about that. Um, and I can mention, you know, like. We don't want to mention a, names. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not going to mention names. I don't know names anymore. I, I, I'm so bad about remembering. About 
getting a balloon uh, really hot to in a competition. So they kind of, they wanted to go up fast um, and they did. They went up really fast because when they released that inflation harness or whatever, no, no, the pilot didn't release it. Some crew member did, um, and probably at the pilot's command. But when he shot up, you know, nobody had really looked to see where he was going to go. Uh, uh, yeah. And there was a mid-air collision. Uh, one balloon went to the ground and uh, almost killed the pilot. Uh, uh, there was, you know, all, you know, the famous were, one was the one in Australia. Yeah, uh, there, two big ride balloons collided. Oh. As an entertainment feature conducted by one of the pilots to to make uh, uh, the, the, the passengers get a thrill while they had a ride. This was a Disney ride. Now. Um, I might add that that pilot escaped Australia with a with a an arrest warrant on his back, and they finally arrested him, and he went to prison for, for life after that. Um, so, I mean, so there is some real benefit to investigating this stuff. So, so on on a plus note for all all the accidents, we <laughs> we learn. We hopefully we share that we share share the learning process from it, so that. The safety seminars are a good way to do that. And that's your, when you were involved, that's where the, those were starting to be more popular. Right. Now we have them every year and, and every state I think has balloon has them so that we can all get together and share and learn so we can um, be better pilots for it. So that was the idea of the, the pilot newsletters origin, a place okay. where we could talk freely without anyone else uh, watching us. And secondly, obviously, uh, a, to give just any kind of detail uh, that is eventually going to be codified into, you know, a manual uh, mm -hmm. of some sort to help people. Mm -hmm. um, I had, <laughs> I was talking to Bruce about this last night about what did, what were the, 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 the best things that we did that we think have still lasted, we hope have still lasted. Um, one of them, one of the most important was what I call crew protocol, what the people on the ground should be doing while the pilot is flying and how do they help the pilot while he's flying. Um, and it's all related to safety. Mm -hmm. It's all related to the crew being aware of where all the other balloons are in the area that are flying near their pilot and being able to call up and say, do you see the green balloon? It's coming up below you. Watch out, it's coming up below you, or there's one getting ready to pass over the top of you. Can you see it? Right, so radios, yeah, radios yeah. and, and the, pro, the protocol, like you said, and then radios and things that have become second nature now were things that helped oh, with all illegal. that safety. Yeah. The radios were illegal in the first Oh, that's true, period. I forgot about that. <laughs> yeah, so until it was pointed out that it was a safety feature and we needed to have them. Uh, so uh, we lobbied for that within the ballooning community, and I think uh, there was a, an, an, a problem with the FAA. They didn't want us using uh, radios, uh, two-way radios, if we weren't communicating with towers and things like that. So, uh, but moving on from that, um, all of the initial efforts as a balloon manufacturer was okay. also aimed at uh, improving the safety and i um uh, i was again talking to bruce i said can i use your name he's oh yeah of course you can use my name I said, well can i say that this is something you did um <laughs> uh, and so we came up with about three things that we did during certification we did type certification uh of cameron balloons for manufacturing in the united states right and uh, I don't know if since us, there has actually been a type certification effort done uh, in the U.S. under uh, Part 31. There is a, a set of regulations you guys have never heard of. Uh, <laughs> oh, it's 31 is manned free balloons airworthiness standards. And how do you, it, it lists the things that you have to prove before you can get a type certificate to manufacture. Right. Um, and one of those that we had to do is what happens with the largest single tear that could happen in a balloon? What happens to the controllability of the balloon 
oh, very interesting. Depends on your altitude, depends on your load, depends on the wind direction, depends on a lot of other things besides right. just the size of the rip. Well, it turns out the size of the rip is 19.2 feet or something like that in a Cameron. Um, and, and all balloons that we've ever built have been done or, you know, excuse me, back when I was <laughs> still involved, we had to make sure that there were rip stoppers uh, at, at least every 19 feet. Uh, I mean, within 19.2 feet or whatever it was apart. And by mm -hmm. rip stop, we put on horizontal load tapes. Most right. of the balloons did not have uh, taping systems in addition to just the regular, you know, seams on the balloon. Right. Uh, the seams on the balloon are actually a rip stopper of sorts. But what it does is it the rip will reach that point and then it will de deflect and run the length of that seam until it hits something stronger than just another seam. Um, and, you know, part of that philosophy uh, has, I mean, it's been in every single balloon that we built and, and it became sort of the standard in other balloons as well, eventually. Um, but uh, part of that came from watching a mid-air collision oh. and watching the balloon rip apart. And David Schaefer wrote a fantastic article in that is, I think it's in Ballooning Journal, it maybe it was in the pilot newsletter, about uh, explosive rips on fabric. We did a lot of testing. We had all sorts of equipment in the factory. We very proudly, anybody came for a tour, had to go see our mm -hmm. um, weathering station where we would weather the fabric and do tests, strength tests, um, mm -hmm. not just on new fabric and, and new seams, but on stuff that had been weathered and aged an appropriate amount. So we could know that, you know, you know, it happens over the life of it. Yeah. What was the life expectancy of that fabric? We set standards for renewal of airworthiness certificates uh, called an annual inspection uh, that became the standard within the whole industry. So that's why you have to, com you can complain to us that you got to have your balloon fabric inspected with a clamp um, you can complain <laughs> about uh, not being able to patch up your own balloon without somebody uh, who knows, A, the patch rules and how to inspect it once it's done and sign off on it and keep a record of it. All of these regulations were written not just for balloons. They were written for airplanes. They were written for Boeing jets down to camera balloons. Um, sure. and, and But they got incorporated through the... FAA's responsibility to encourage aviation in uh, a, a way that keeps it safe, not just to let people go out and start flying with paying passengers in balloons that um, have not have been tested, proven, or what have you. Um, getting a type certificate, uh, again, Bruce and I loved the process because uh, we were constantly being challenged. How are we going to prove this? How are we going to prove that the propane tank is not going to explode if it hits the ground at such and such a speed. Sure. We had to do that. So we, we figured out a way to fill the propane tank. But no, not we. Bruce figured out a way. We'll fill the water with water. We'll put it at a certain altitude and then we will drop that tank and see what happens okay. with an FAA observer. Um, and uh, we did. You know, all this kind of stuff went into the documentation on um, the balloon. Now, at the time we were doing this, there were two types of, of, of uh, tanks. There were Worthington aluminum tanks, which were nice, lightweight, and everybody used them except Raven. Raven had a, stain, a great stainless steel tank in their uh, big basket, but it weighed a blasted ton when it was empty. So... This was the first attempt to do something with uh, a, a tank specifically made um, for balloons that wasn't Raven. I give Raven full credit for that. But there were all sorts of different tests we did on fabric, uh, Kevlar uh, load tape, uh, Kevlar webbing. Um, uh, there were, every time you came up with something that made ballooning either safer or better or uh, uh, easier for crew members or pilots, you had to go through a vast array of tests before sure. you could get approval on it. Um, yeah, and, makes sense. You know, yeah. And that was really, really cool. It was a lot of fun. 
uh, and and we're so happy we did it. We discovered after we had done all of this that we didn't have to do all this. We could have just ridden along on the coattail of Cameron Balloons Limited, which had already received its type certificate. Uh, but Cameron Limited also didn't have to do many of the requirements re uh, listed in Part 31 because Part 31 had been modified by the FAA to add a bunch of provisions that weren't there when Cameron Limited uh, uh, got their type certificate and the Thunder Colt got theirs and Lindstrand got theirs and what have you. So the 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 I'm not sure if there was anyone who got obtain a, a type certificate after we did. If they did, <laughs> they've got my sympathy. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what, Tucker, all that all that talent, you know, it is fun for the people who work on it, like you and Bruce, you were talking about you and Bruce yeah. working together on it. I can tell you, you were lighting up when you were talking about it. It was it was a challenge, but you were up to the challenge and you, it was fun to find the answers, right? Yeah, and you know, people, what was fun is we could bring people in that were, you know, interested in ballooning and they would start to say, wow, I had no idea you had to go through all of this. I mean, we went through uh, developing the, the hyperlast fabric, which my, my pet project was hyperlast fabric, um, and finding a way to make the fabric less porous at the same time, be able to stop uh, uh, ripping when it, you know, sort of just got breathed on and, you know, not so flammable and all this and that and the other. All of those developments were done in the early 80s and pretty much everything uh, that uh, I left the sport when I came full time into Costa Rica. Well, mm -hmm. and that's not true. I was doing paid rides in Costa Rica, um, but my manufacturing days were over <laughs> because Andy was uh, so much better at it. And then Andy made the fatal mistake of saying, I'll buy the company for me. If you can. <laughs> <laughs> I, okay. <laughs> I, I, so so, you and Andy Baird made a deal and, and the rest is history, oh, right? <laughs> oh, absolutely. Uh, and it has worked out fantastically for me. I hope it's worked out as well for Andy. <laughs> well, I think so. I, I, I personally think that you left the, the business in good hands. The Andy is, is well, a stellar person. Yes. I, I left it at the right time for me because I found a, a, a different life, completely different. Anybody would have ever told me I would have ended up living on a cow farm in the middle of nowhere in Costa Rica. I would have. I you would have said, what? Built, <laughs> yep, yep, yep. That's, and, but I also have built a home here. And a lot of my home is built on things I learned as a balloon manufacturer. My, I just, I'm just standing here noticing that I my, my balcony, I don't know if I'm, I'm going to turn around so that you can see the balcony. That's okay. a little balcony off my bedroom. Oh, pretty. Very nice. Yeah. I can, I can a, see why you stayed, Tucker. It's, it's a beautiful yeah. <laughs> country. Yeah, just a little bit I can see today. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, the balcony is a balloon, basically designed like a balloon basket. It's got uh, stainless steel cables on the corners that are attached to a beam much higher on the on the roof. So um, the, again, balloon technology, I knew exactly how much that thing could hold. And, <laughs> and one, one, one party, we had over 80 people standing on that balcony. Now that exceeds the limits that a normal hotel balcony would be able to sustain. But uh, yeah, I, I have used all that information that we learned while we were uh, uh, setting up the manufacturing. Um, sure. And we were very proud of that, but you know, even prouder of the, the safety factor it gave. One yeah. of the things we we're talking about, again, is in competition, this mid-air collision thing. Um, being able to, to know that you've built the balloon in a way that those rip stoppers really will work uh, I mean, if somebody flies the balloon right through the side of your balloon, you're going to have a hole there. There's no doubt about it. The question is, will the balloon streamer? Right. And I watched that happen. Uh, I think I watched it happen in Japan. Do you remember that one? I do. Yeah. 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 So it's, oh. it's uh, these are the things that move, motivate you as a manufacturer. And as a pilot. Sure. Um, you also, um, Paulo Bonanno, you you worked with him on burners. Tucker, what we're going to pause here. Put your put your camera up a little bit so we can see you better. Oh, the other way, the other way. I guess down. 
down. There we go. Okay, now you're saying, oh, beautiful. That's perfect. Okay, go for it. So Paulo Bonanno. Yeah, Paulo, yeah, we were great friends and um, I made the Mecca to, to Mondavi as many uh, balloonists did. Um, and uh, we were working on getting something that was uh, robust. Uh, Cameron built, ha! well, I think Tom even had one of the old red burners. That was robust. When you're done uh, flying the balloon and it was going to go to the junker, you could take that burner out and you could plow fields with it. Um, but uh, we were looking for something that had a really reliable pilot light. Pilot lights were the nemesis of ballooning in the early days because um, they would go out and, and the strikers that people carried were just not enough to get them going again. And if you were at any kind of altitude, you were in deep trouble. Uh, getting strikers built into the pilot lights. Everybody takes that for granted. That was a great ah, innovation. Yeah. Uh, getting uh, a, a, a pilot light that wouldn't go out every time you descended the balloon. Why is the pilot light going out? Well, all this uh, air is rushing out of the envelope as, the, as you descend, it goes down and it just whooshes out the burner. Um, the uh, other big innovations were a plumbing system that was custom made. It wasn't pieces of plumbing for propane tanks taken off the shelf anymore. Uh, and that was a lot of Paolo Bonanno and Tom Sage in Bristol. Um, and the two fought tooth and nail, still do. Uh, uh, I know Paolo's around because I talked to him about a week ago, he was getting ready to go off sailing. <laughs> okay. Uh, but uh, Tucker, tip, I, tip your camera up again. Oh, there you um, go. Okay. okay. I thought you wanted to see my frog. Okay. No, okay. <laughs> well, I did. It's cute. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I want to see you too. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but a lot of the robustness of burners in general came from those designs. And certainly every manufacturer has had a standard. Uh, to to follow after those uh, innovations by Paolo. Paolo was really the, the, the striking force behind all balloon burner development um, and um, give him credit. <laughs> well, um, I'll, I'll tell you an aside, Paolo was put into the, he, he was inducted into the International Hall of Fame for his work on burners, et cetera. Yeah, so uh, recognized worldwide. Yeah. The testing of those burners though, really came in competitions all over the world. Uh, and everybody that, uh, the, the thing that I remember being a motivating factor was going to the Cameron Balloons dealer meetings every year in Bristol. There would be pilots from every country imaginable, uh, especially uh, I remember the Japanese being there, the, the Swedes being there, um, uh, people who were really into competition talking about a problem they had with the burner or a problem with the tank. And Paolo and Tom uh, would sit down with these people and get as much possible detail. A detail. And from those things, innovations like a, um, a valve in the tank that uh, didn't just rely on one O-ring, uh, wasn't just something that you put on the back of a forklift truck. Um, you, you know, there's so many innovations that came from pilots coming up and complaining to, you know, Cameron Balloons. So okay. I loved it. <laughs> I love those meetings. I love being able to, to say, well, we had this experience and this is how we solved it. I mean, I'm probably the only person around still that pressurizes my tanks with nitrogen. Um, uh, I, I haven't flown as a pilot now for like 10 or 12 years, but we always pressurized here in Costa Rica with nitrogen. Okay. Um, and um, what was another one of the things I was talking about the, 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 the string ball. We were, you know, we developed the string ball for competition so you could sort of read the low wind conditions. And that's a, you know, the crew always had to go put the pilot that up so that they could let the pilot know at 50 feet, you've got a very strong left. You know, you is can't that, is see. That, is that when you had, the, you had the balloon on the end of the um, fishing line? Yeah. 
Well, no, okay. no, 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 no. There was no fishing line. That's the that's the improvement on it. Okay. The original oh. one was on the end of a. The original one was on the end of what I had with me in my purse, which is dental floss. Oh, um, okay. And uh, and later uh, after that first experience with dental floss, we went home and bought a a, a, a surveyor's uh, string uh, with a string that was retractable. And then that developed into now. I guess they're using uh, fish. Uh, you know, Bruce mentioned. Oh, yeah, they're using um, fishing pole or fishing line. Yep. Oh, that makes sense. Except fishing line is really dangerous for birds that are flying. You know, the, these. Well, uh, hopefully, they, hopefully they they they, they yeah. actually peel out, uh, wheel it back in so that they they oh, go to the okay. next target and use it. So they're so they're the um. Oh, we're, it's we're being it logically it correct. Like yes. Yes. Yeah, thank you. That <laughs> makes you feel better. <laughs> I was really afraid about it. Want to make you feel better. Yeah, we are making yeah. improvements that are positive too. Yes. We so were put your camera back a little bit. <laughs> Bruce was throwing marshmallows out of the balloon. And we're, our job on the ground is with a theodolite to try to find the marshmallow and track it. Oh down. my gosh. <laughs> we went through all sorts of different levels of stupidity before we came up with something that worked. Um, but it's the fun part of it is, is going through that stupid sort of analysis to figure it out and then yeah. deciding, yeah, it's, um, it's not uh, such a stupid idea after all, until you try it. I remember the long discussions at, at pilot briefings, Tucker, where the question was the rule that says pilots may only drop things, uh, lightweight things. And so, okay. So then the question, does that include cornflakes? Does that include shaving cream? Does that include marshmallows? Right. So all yeah. that goes into place. And what would you, yeah. All of them. Yeah. Oh, very good. <laughs> so they all got tried and tested. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, let me ask a question about um, 1981 when the worlds came to Battle Creek, because you were one of the okay. reasons that that came. And then you had to step back. But I also want you to it's, your camera has moved you. We're seeing your your ear now. So okay, there we go. There you are again. <laughs> okay. All right. So can you tell us about bringing the worlds to Battle Creek? It was. Uh, it was really uh, knowing the right people to pull a whole organization together. Uh, of course, Bob Kinsinger was the great motivator. He was the guy that wanted that to come uh, because he was beginning to see that this could be an identity uh, for somebody besides Albuquerque and Indianola. Um, and so when he got a hold of me, I <laughs> got hold of Tom Shepard and said, Tom, I think I've got a job for you, but I don't know <laughs> if you're up, up to taking this one on because it's not up in, in you know, nice part of the country. It gets pretty, it, well, what am I talking about? You're from Wisconsin. Uh, <laughs> yeah, what do you mean? <laughs> and Michigan is still the great Midwest, so we're good. <laughs> right, we're okay. But yeah, so I got out of it because as soon as Bruce qualified for that championship, uh, uh, I just would have my focus devoted in too many different directions. Yeah. Um, and my loyalty, of course, first and foremost was to Bruce. Right. Well, and Battle Creek certainly has to thank you for them being a, a ballooning mecca every year because it's worked out pretty well for them, hasn't it? <laughs> it has. And it, I think uh, in general, it made world championships back on the map or, you know, the whole idea that we could handle that repeat, repeatedly in the U.S. Uh, there was a lot of complaining originally when all of the championships were held in the U.S. because other countries wanted a chance at it. So Castle Howard happened. Um, mm -hmm. And the problem with Castle Howard was that there was a North Sea and that limited how far you could go before, you know, hitting the water. Um, and... Uh, uh, Baton Rouge. Oh, Bruce and my Courtney, excuse me, reminded me why we invented the squeezer. We didn't invent oh, okay. the squeezer. Oh, I forgot. Yeah, let's talk about that. This is really, this is because in Baton Rouge, and they moved the nationals to, to Baton Rouge. And because right. in Baton Rouge, the one thing I read is that they have horrible case of problems with fire ants in Baton right. Rouge. Yes, that's so a true we, statement. Yes. <laughs> We invented this thing so that the we the the crew never had to touch the balloon other than to strap oh, this thing on. Okay. And you never had to touch the fabric because and they were absolutely right about the fire ants. And the fire ants also could eat holes through the balloon. Oh and I wasn't okay. as worried about that as eating holes through me. Um, uh, 
but it had the effect both ways. It, it kept most of the ants off the balloon, but mainly it kept the crew out of the fire ants. There. Which is very Pretty thankful. Good. Yes, yes. Those are nasty. Yeah, very good. Um, let's see. Well, there was one other thing. I, well, actually, it's kind of together. Um, interesting people you, you've met over the years just because you've been a balloonist. Oh, well, you got it put at the top of the list, Magomed. Um, and we became super good friends over the years. And I ended up sponsoring, well, he's a Russian cosmonaut. He was the closest thing Russia has to a pilot of the Soviet space shuttle. Um, and they never did fly it manned, uh, but they flew it and landed it uh, with Magomed flying a SU-37 or what, 23, I can't remember those numbers, uh, a jet next to it and controlling the space shuttle as it came in and landed. Um, so he never actually piloted because no one did uh, in flight, but uh, he is still involved in other kinds of ballooning, like he's trying to do a balloon jump drop from outside the atmosphere. Um, I just read about that the other day in a, a publication uh, about uh, Russian um, uh, air adventures. Okay. So I think you can find Magomed, M A G O M E D is how you spell his first name, and Tolboyev is his last name. And he's, he's if you ever get a chance to meet him, tell him Tucker said hi. I miss him. <laughs> I, I uh, sponsored him for inclusion in the Society of um, Experimental Test Pilots. Uh, to be a, that, you had to have piloted a an aircraft in a as a test pilot uh, above certain altitude for a certain. I can't remember all the requirements, but I know that it was very prestigious because George Myers, who was the test pilot from the FAA that certified Cameron Balloons U.S., uh, was one of the founding members. And uh, when I expressed my great joy in um, um, space, you know, exploration, what have you, and gave, I gave him a book uh, called Carrying the Fire, and it okay. was written by uh, the astronaut that did not land on the moon on the first lunar landing, um, and he took the book from me, and he brought it back to me about six months later, and it was signed by that astronaut. <laughs> Oh, cool. <laughs> uh, that's been on my, my bookshelf all these years. A treasure, treasure, yeah. and a great book. Uh, you want to talk about a great book to read. I got two great books for everybody to read. Okay. One of them is Carrying the Fire. Um, and the second one is Anthony Smith's Throw Out Two Hands. And that one I mentioned, I, I didn't mention it. I tried to mention it earlier, my mother gave that to me and Bruce when she was worried about us becoming stodgy old office workers. Uh, when we had just gotten into this new profession, they called computers. Computers didn't exist, remember, back then, guys. <laughs> um, Throw Out Two Hands uh, was written about Anthony's, the true story of Anthony flying a balloon across Africa in 1960. And it was a gas balloon. Um, and the story is hysterically funny, full okay. of memorable characters. And uh, I strongly recommend anyone who has interested in ballooning to know a little bit about where it all started. Anthony Smith went on to become the founder of, of one of the founders of the British Balloon and Airship Club. Right. Uh, and so the name of the book is Throw Out Two Hands, referring to through two hands full of sand out of the sandbag. So read okay. the book. Okay. Uh, and the other, Carrying the Fire, is about how a, an astronaut gets trained when it, you're going to be the first person to go to the moon. Cool. That was very interesting. So. Okay. Well, Tucker, I I um, also, well, I'm going to have to move your camera again or sit yourself uh, up or something. I'm sorry. I'm going to get, find my seat here. Here All I am. Right. Okay. Uh -huh. Let's get you comfortable. Okay. I don't want to go over the side because if I go over the side, I No, don't I do that. A lot harder than a 140 with a solo pilot in it. <laughs> we don't want you to go, go down. But I okay. would like you to um, to finish out with um, sharing about your life in Costa Rica. You moved down there a lot of years ago and you're still there. So 
And tip your camera up just a little bit. Okay. Okay, there okay. we go. I can see your smiling face. All right. Yeah. All right. I'm going to turn around and let you see where I am, first of all, in relation to the earth. Um, uh, this You're is, above the trees. I'm above the trees. My house is above the trees. Um, my house is uh, a, you know, it's, I, it's, the one thing that I designed completely and convinced an engineer that, yeah, we can put it there. He said, Tucker, you don't understand. You don't know what kind of soil this is. This thing is just going to go sliding down that hill and you're going to end up in the Tree Alba River. And that's, I'll walk over to the corner so you can see what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. um, so now I'm going to try to keep this on me as I turn around. So you can see me and you can also see the, this is, I'm sitting on my front deck. Um, Phil Dunnington was here one time and he said, my God, Tucker, that deck, this deck is exactly like the, the observation deck on the Hindenburg. And oh, I wow. Said, How do you know that? He said, because I was there. Really? Wow. <laughs> no, he wasn't. Of course he wasn't there. <laughs> <laughs> it is, <laughs> but. But he, he was, history, you're telling me. Yes, <laughs> say, but he, he was in one, uh, uh, Dunnington was in one of the sister ships of the Hindenburg. Okay. Uh, as there were quite a few uh, uh, German airships, and he was in one of the other ones. And they all had the same sort of observation deck. Uh, and he said, yeah, this is what makes uh, my, my property so wonderful. And now I don't live here anymore. I live on a cow farm because I fell in love. And moved to be he wasn't going to move the cows here there wasn't enough land for the cows <laughs> so this is where we are uh i'm here now because i come over here about once every couple of months but i have been gone for seven months because i was in the hospital lucky me but that's over <laughs> oh and that over there is my takeoff field uh for the balloon over your uh, shoulder what we're seeing there beyond uh, the trees uh, no, sorry um I'm, I'm looking the wrong direction. Let's see here. I got to turn around. You see a big green, there's a green field over there. Anyway, no, maybe you can't see it. No, not quite. quite. No, we see lots of trees though, but we're good. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, and the trees, uh, the, these do not have monkeys, uh, but they do have toucans and orals pendulas and birds that you've never seen or heard of uh, in the States. And it's a Real paradise, and I rent it out as an Airbnb. So it works out really well. commercial for the end. Because, and I can, yeah. I can hear the birds in the background. It sounds very pretty. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. There's always a lot of birds around here. So okay. my life is with my husband, Jaime. I'm, he's not my husband. I'm not allowed to say that. My life is with Jaime, who is the person that rescued me from uh, spending the rest of my life alone. And he takes good care of me. Um, oh, I see an auto pendula it just landed in the tree right there. But excuse me, I get distracted. It's OK. Yeah. All right. So, Tucker, can I I'm going to ask you to put the camera and I'm going to try to send to you. So when, before we finish, we've got a good shot of you. And um, all right. So let's see. Camera, bring your computer forward a little bit, a little more. All right. Beautiful. So we've got the background and um, and you you. Uh, standing there in your paradise very nice there's a paradise yeah well hey tucker i really appreciate you spending this time sharing your adventures and saving this so that when you and i are both gone history can is somebody can watch this and go those two ladies had a lot of fun ballooning didn't they <laughs> we <laughs> had so much fun in the beginning and i and i worry about do. People that don't have the opportunity to do something that no one else has done. I, you know, I'll give you an example. We've been talking the other day. I, I'm buying an old beat up car and I'm giving it to a guy so that he can let kids steal the car so they can learn to drive. Oh. Because that's how I learned to drive. <laughs> they don't have that kind of thing here in Costa Rica. No option to learn from no the car. Option. So, yeah, oh, that's really my new business is teaching kids how to steal cars <laughs> in a positive way. I'm, I'm going to leave it at that. Way. All right. I well, I'm going to, I'm, Tucker, I'm going to shut down our, our um, recording. Stay with me, though. Okay. So All right. th thank you very much for um, for spending the time with me. And uh, we'll close the, the recording down. Thank you.